Thank you for being here this morning. Let's take our Bibles, if you will, to, uh, to Romans chapter 8. This will be our 45th. We've been in Ephesians for, we've been in Romans for a year, haven't we? Yeah. The first two pages of your notes, I, I, the reason I did this is not on, on one side. The first two pages of notes is a synopsis overview of the first of the chapter of Romans. So, without me having to go over that, I want you to take time later to read an overview. Because sometimes we don't, we need to continue to realize that we're talking about one subject. And because I have taken 45 weeks to preach down through verse 28, 29, and 30, sometimes we lose the connection. And Paul is presenting one case, one argument, and some objections. And he's working through the process that's taken us a year. And oftentimes we forget that process. And sometimes I have to go back and say the difference. So we are doing that. But we are looking now at verse 28 through verse 31 but not today. And we know, and I trust, before we finish the book of Romans, and before we finish Romans 8, that you will know. I hope you can say, I know. I know. I understand. I get it. That will change your perspective on all that Paul is trying to say. And we know experimentally that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Then, Paul continues with verse 31, What shall we then say to these things? these verses that we've just read. If God be for us, who can be against us? Right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit endeavoring and helping us establish the truth that is set before us. There is an argument, there is a challenge, and there is an answer to what Paul is trying to establish in our lives, that all of us face continually these things. And so as we approach this text, may we approach it with the desire to be understood, 
the desire to know the truth. Help us to grasp the truth as we speak this morning, that we might have the fulfillment in our lives of knowing that all things work together for good, and more so, our eternal salvation is secure. And we give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Romans chapter 1 through chapter 3 establishes for us the doctrine of justification by faith. Romans chapter 4 right, raises the problem with this. Romans 5 gives us the doctrine. Number Romans 6 and 7 gives us the objection. And then in Romans 8 confirms the truth. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Paul's theme is justification by faith. He deals with the difficulties and the objections that you and I have heard most of our lives. The difficulty that people have with this doctrine and the objections that people throw out their hands and say it's not true. He designs ways to prove this principle and he does it so abundantly to the people he writes and he does it so that they may never again have trouble concerning what Paul is saying through the Holy Spirit, but will rejoice in their great salvation. We need to learn to rejoice in our salvation. Paul states in verses 28 through verse 30 in the positive. Then in verse 31, as we see later in verse 34, in the negative form. How do we really know? How do we really know God's will that He will do it? How do we really know verse 28 is real? He states the truth. Then he considers the objections of that truth. Then he establishes the truth yet more firmly. I just can't believe it. And he answers that question. Now, as I said before, the whole chapter is involved with that. Paul wants to drive home a truth of God. To bring it home to the mind and to the hearts of men and women. If it can be driven home in your mind, that God has a purpose for calling you. If it can, you can grasp it, it'll change your life. So Paul raises up questions, queries concerning what he has been saying. Here's what he's been saying. Here are seven things. What shall we then say to these things? Number two, if God be for us, who can be against us? He, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Number five, who is he that condemneth? Number six, who shall separate us from the love of God? And then number seven, shall tribulation... Shall distress, shall persecution, shall nakedness, shall pearl, shall sword, shall any of these separate us from the love of God? Who or what shall separate, and that is the main question, from the love of God? So the question is, is there anything that's going to separate us from the love of God? And Paul's going to answer that. Then in verse 38 through verse 39 is the ultimate assertion of, the glory, of, the, of, the, uh, of this glorious truth of the absolute security and the final pers perseverance of the believer. So what Paul is establishing and ultimately trying to establish in the hearts of the people he's writing to 
is you have absolute security in your final perseverance of the believers. So Paul is saying you can be sure I'm going to show you that nothing can separate you from the love of God that will not prevent you from going to heaven. And after all the objections has been raised, he answers them. Then he, persu he, he did he's persuaded of his truth. I am persuaded. And I would like to see that from everybody. I am now been persuaded that what you say is true. Some of you have been pondering that for a year. I'm not quite sure if what he has been saying is true. And Paul is saying, I know you feel that way. Therefore, I'm going to approach it from a different angle. I'm telling you the truth. You've just not been persuaded yet. And sometimes it takes five or six, seven or eight, nine or ten, forty-five sermons to convince you of the truth. And sometimes it takes Paul forever to get through all these verses to try to convince you, this I know. And you can say that honestly. Now, let's look at these questions in the form of a problem or a challenge to this doctrine of eternal security, which is a problem. Verse 31. Is there any convincible power that can prevent us arriving at that ultimate glorification? Is there any conceivable power that can prevent our arriving at that ultimate glorification? Verse 31. Number 2, verse 32 says, Is any danger, is there any danger that God's love to us may undergo a change or be diminished? That's the question. Verse 33 and verse 34, Is someone or something who may finally convince us of sin and bring, convict us of sin and bring us to final condemnation. 